All right, I got to start my sermon, and I'm going to start my sermon by lighting this candle. Isn't that wonderful to know? All right. <laughs> okay, so we are going to get right into the Word this morning, and uh, we're preaching on a pretty big subject here today out of Matthew chapter 24. We'll put that up on the screen here today. This is part three to this sermon series collision course, and we're talking about priorities, perspectives, and the posture of God's people in these last days. Matthew 24, that is a whale of a chapter. There is so much in Matthew chapter 24. I won't be able to get into the nitty-gritty of all of it. This may be kind of scratching the surface, but there's so many things that are pertinent for our day and age here today in just understanding the days that we live, these last days that we live. So we're going to look at a few verses in Matthew chapter 24, but uh, I, I love the Word of God, and I think it's so important in understanding God's Word is to understand the context of the Scriptures that we read and that we teach. So I want to give a little context of Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is at the end of His ministry. He's soon, or he's soon going to be ushered back into Jerusalem and be tried and scourged and uh, then eventually crucified on the cross. Uh, so this in chapter 24 is His last visit to the temple. This is his last time contending with the religious leaders. Um, and so he's actually uh, finishes his ministry in the temple and he begins to leave the temple. Um, and uh, he walks out of the temple. And I, I just had to put this picture several years ago, Connie and I were in the Holy Land. And this would have been some of the ground that Jesus walked in and out of the temple almost every day. So it, when we found out that these were some of the steps where Jesus had walked, we had to stop there and have a moment. And so we wanted to touch the ground where Jesus walked. But I tell you, a trip to the Holy Land, you would not regret it. Uh, it's an amazing trip, and it just really brings the Scriptures alive. So Jesus is leaving the temple, and at that time, the temple was under expansion by Herod the Great. Uh, actually, the temple, the first temple Solom that Solomon built was destroyed, and now uh, Herod the Great is beginning to rebuild and expand the temple. The temple is huge. It was four football fields wide by five football fields long. That's a big area, isn't it? And so he's expanding the temple. He started it before Jesus was born in about 19 B.C., and it wasn't completed till about 63 A.D., and that would have been after Jesus was uh, you know, crucified and then raised and ascended into heaven. And it's interesting that after it was completed in A.D. 63, only seven years later, it was destroyed again by Rome. So, in fact, if you go there today, you'll see that uh, there's still rubble from the second temple that was uh, destroyed by Rome. And uh, there's a statement that Jesus makes in this passage that, that this was that prophecy or that promise was fulfilled, and there's a picture to prove it. They've left those, uh, that rubble there just for posterity. But anyways, so 40 years after Jesus makes this statement that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 24, the temple is destroyed again by Rome. And I want you to know that whenever somebody would speak against the temple, that was like blasphemy. Uh, it, it, because that was the center for Jewish life. And Jesus makes a statement which appears to be blasphemous. And so they, they're looking at the temple. They, they leave uh, the temple and they walk to the mountain Ol Mount of Olives about a half mile away. I've taken that walk. In fact, in this picture, Connie and I are standing in the Mount of Olives. It's actually it's just a grove of olive trees. It overlooks the city and the temple you can see there if you're really up close. Um, but again, it just kind of comes alive. When I read this, I'm, I'm like right there. It's awesome. Who would like to go to the Holy Land someday and have that experience for yourself? Man, it's awesome. So, that's where we pick up the text. Look at it, verse 1 in chapter 24, and we'll just go through this, uh, these verses. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. I mean, you couldn't miss it. It was, it was a huge, uh, fortif uh, not fortification, but uh, buildings. So he said, uh, he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Now again, that's a negative statement towards the temple. So it got everybody's attention. And they're wondering, you know, Jesus, he was kind of viewed as a revolutionary without swords and shields. But, you know, people listening to that didn't know if that was coming. I mean, his 
following was growing, and, and maybe those in power were thinking, this Jesus, man, he's going to start a revolution here. So is this a threat? Is this a threat to the temple? You're saying that it's going to be completely demolished? He said, not one stone will be left on top of another. So they leave the temple. They go to Mount of Olives, and it's bugging the disciples. They're like, Oh, this statement, I can't get this out of our, our, my mind. I need to ask this question. So they're, they get with him privately and they say, tell us, Master, when will all this happen? What will be the signal of your, turn, your return and the end of the world? You know, what's going to happen and when, that, when is it going to happen? And that's what anybody even today wants to know when it comes to prophecy is what's going to happen and, and when? Tell me when is it going to happen? So they have that question in their own mind, and then Jesus goes on, and he, the first thing he says is, don't let anyone mislead you, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Next verse. Nation will uh, go to war against nation. And that word na nation can be translated from the Greek as ethnos and race. So race goes against race. Uh, we're seeing some of that even today and have throughout history. But he says, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then jump down to verse 11 for the sake of time. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. So here we have the disciples are asking questions. What's going to happen? When is it going to happen? And if you, if you study the teachings of Jesus, oftentimes when they would ask a question to Jesus, Jesus wouldn't answer them directly. Many times when they'd ask a question, he'd fire back a question to them. If they asked, so should we pay taxes to Caesar? What did Jesus? He fired a question. He said, well, whose, whose picture is on a coin? So he'd often answer with another question. And what he did was he's getting people engaged. He didn't tell them the answer directly. Just, you know, just cut to the chase and give them the answer. No, Jesus wanted engagement. Oftentimes, he'd respond with a story. They'd have a question, and he'd respond with a story, a parable, another confusing <laughs> way to present truth. And always later, they're coming back to Jesus. You know, it, it's bugging us, Jesus. You told this story. What does that mean? So Jesus didn't always tell people what they wanted to hear. He told them what they needed to hear. He didn't always tell them what they wanted to know. He would tell them what they needed to know. And I know even today, we want to know, you know, what's happening in our world? What about the one world government? What about the rise of the Antichrist? Uh, you know, what, what are these events? And then when? That, that's the only thing people want to know about prophecy today is, is what? And when. So today, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. Not what you necessarily want to know, but what you need to know. And I think it's amazing some of these verses that, that Jesus really gives us great understanding as to, uh, you know, what's going on today. Now, I know that uh, this last week maybe has been a tough week for some of us, some of you who, who you know, your guy didn't get elected, or maybe some of you, it's, it's great because your guy did get elected. I don't know, but, uh, you know, maybe it was a week where you're a little bit discouraged or, you know, you're just thinking, now you're a little confused because your ideas, your thoughts, your, your timeline, your scenario didn't work out like you had really thought or you really hoped, and now you find yourself having to walk back some of your strong opinions that you had. Uh, maybe you find yourself a little quiet. You're not posting as much on social media. You've become unglued to the television. You're just kind of avoiding it because uh, now you're a little bit confused that, uh, you know, I thought this was going to happen, and I thought that, that this was God's plan, and I thought this was the timeline, and it's not. It, apparently, what I think is not quite in sync 
with God's plan. That's why I believe this word is really going to help us this morning to understand a little bit about uh, not necessarily what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. So uh, Jesus gives five, gives us, and there might be more, but I, I picked out five priorities, perspectives, and a posture for God's people in these last days. And it's interesting when they ask, you know, uh, what and when is all this going to happen? The first thing that Jesus says, he doesn't you know, he throws them a few bones in this passage. He says, well, nations are going to rise against nation. You're going to hear rumors of war, and uh, there's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. And so he throws them a few bones, but again, he doesn't, he doesn't get specific as to what and when, especially the when part. But in response to their questions, look what Jesus, he helps them to focus on what's really important. And he says, don't let anyone mislead you. The, uh, in other words, it's a priority that we need to be alert and be ready. Regardless of what's happening around us, we need to be alert and ready and understand the importance of what's happening inside of us. And the King James in this passage says, take heed. In other words, take some personal inventory. Take heed of what's going on, not necessarily out here, but what's going on in here so that you aren't misled. See, that's something you can control. We can't control all this other stuff, but how you perceive it, how you internalize it, how you practice it, live it out, that's something. And so the Bible says, take heed, watch out, don't let anyone mislead you. In other words, I think Jesus is really helping us to understand that instead of focusing on everything going on around you, pay attention to what's going on inside of you, what's happening in here. That's the important part. Um, How's my relationship with Jesus? Maybe maybe the Lord would ask us that question this morning. How about your passion for God? Is there a passion that you have? How about a life of purity? Are you living a life of purity? Is your mind being renewed? See, forget about everything around you and all the details and the timeline and think about what's happening inside of you. Is my mind being renewed? Or am I just focused on all this other stuff And I'm failing to take heed and take a personal inventory about the passion and my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's easy to get lulled to sleep and lose what's important in our lives and let our guard down. You know, and so when we take a moment and and we just really take a personal inventory, it's not that we're questioning our salvation. Maybe some of you aren't saved. You've never surrendered your life to the Lord. At the end of this service, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. But those of us who've been walking with the Lord, but you're just like confused, discouraged, and you're wondering if, is this stuff really real? I mean, uh, it's not that we question our salvation or that our salvation is ineffective, but I wonder if we take an inventory because maybe our effectiveness is ineffective. Maybe... Maybe we've just been lulled to sleep and we've got our eyes off the ball and we got it focusing on everything around us and the, the spiritual priority in our life, that relationship with him, it, it, you know, maybe that's been lowered because now everything else has filled in in the ladder, the other priorities, priorities of financial security, priorities, of just, I just, I want to be happy in life. Uh, uh, I want to be financially secure. I, I want things to be convenient. I want, I want to be comfortable here on this earth. Very important things. Nothing wrong with those things, but those things cannot be more important, or they should not be more important, than our relationship with God. This has got to be right. And Jesus really tried to teach us and his disciples that he said, seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about it. The pagans worry about it. Non-believers worry about those things. You trust me first. Make it your priority to, to make sure that you are alert and that you are ready. So I th- find it very interesting that Jesus didn't really go to, okay, when is all this going to happen? He said, don't worry about that. You be alert. You be ready. All right? Now, the second one is this, found in verse 6. Look at uh, verse 6. He says, and you'll hear of wars and threats of wars, but here it is right here. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. He's saying, don't panic. And that's a perspective, isn't it? Don't worry. Don't panic about everything that's happening around us. Don't panic. And you look at our world, and everybody's 
A lot of people are just filled with anxiety. They're filled with fear. They're, you know, just wondering, you know, it, it, it's easy to get discouraged um, and just filled with anxiety. Uh, it, people are so agitated. Just look at the anger in our society. People fighting each other on social media. Christians, churches fighting each other. Uh, people fighting each other on TV. Uh, people being canceled out of culture because of a, a, an opposing opinion or view. But guess what? Jesus said these things must take place. In other words, it isn't a surprise of who got elected. It isn't a surprise of this, that God is like thrown off his game now because, uh, you know, different things have, have happened and it's outside of his plan. No, God is, God is a sovereign God. And he's the one who appoints and he, he rises up and he brings down leaders. And that's where we have to trust. And we can't be in panic mode and worry about everything. See, there are world events that have happened in the history of the world that people thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> I mean, I did a bunch of research this week and there are, I couldn't even list all of them. It would take us forever. But there are events, world events that have happened that uh, people thought it was the end. Now, we're going to go to 1666, but there were a lot of things before this. All the crusades, a lot of evil things done in the name of religion and in the name of the church. But let me just jump to 1666. Now, the key here is look at the year. 1666, 666. Now, that generation that was alive, there, they were thinking, wow, 1666, that's an odd year. And what happened in 1666 was the Great Fire of London. I mean, almost the whole city was burned. 85 churches were burned to the ground. Surely that generation was saying, this has got to be the end of the world. This is God's fiery judgment upon mankind. Even the churches are, are burned. So every generation looks at their circumstances and thinks this is the end of the world. It doesn't stop there. Look at this. In 1843, there was a man named William Miller who predicted the second coming of the Lord. And I mean, this was 1863. He had 100,000 people in, in America buy into this and joined this cult called the Millerites. Now, even in today, it's hard to get 100,000 Twitter followers. I mean, you got to be like famous, right? So back then, with little communication, maybe horse and pony, or uh, pony and rider, whatever you call it. Uh, I, I mean, maybe word got around, but here, 100,000 followers bought into that the Lord is returning. And again, he didn't come in 43, so he changed his calculations to, to 1844. They always do that, don't they? Um, then you got 1861, the Civil War, brother fighting against brother, 650,000 dead later. You know, can you imagine that generation thinking, man, this is the end of the world? Um, in 1910, Halley's Comet was thought to, it was going to just. Uh, crash into the earth, and that would be the end of the world. Uh, 1914 was World War I, the world converging in this, in this war. Uh, you know, what's, what's going to take place? Uh, it's the end of the world, uh, which led to the 30s, the Great Depression, where the banks closed. There was a run on the banks. You couldn't get your money out. Maybe this is the time for the one world government. Maybe this is, you know, we're going to a cashless society. They probably couldn't even fathom what that would look like. But again, every generation thought this is the end of the world. And then you even have more. 1933, the Holocaust. An attempted genocide of the Jewish people. Six million people. Six million Jews killed. I mean, that, that's God's people. Surely that generation is saying, this has got to be the end of the world. And then that led to World War II. And many thought that Hitler, he was the Antichrist. Surely this is the end of the world. The signs are happening. Uh, then... More recent days, in the 80s, there was the AIDS epidemic. I mean, that, that was just hit the world big time. And everybody's thinking, well, this is God's judgment on evil humanity, the AIDS epidemic. Uh, 1990, the Gulf War. And any war in the Middle East, of course, we're thinking, oh, okay, they're going to team up and they're going to, you know, take out Israel. So that was a big stir. A lot of books were written in that time uh, about then you got year 2000, Y2K, remember that? Oh, everybody, that was the end of the world. The big computer crash. Now the economies are going to collapse. The financial, they're going to collapse. And everybody's buying generators and store away food. That's where that all began. And, and we thought that was the end of the world. I mean, how many books? I, I read many books from preachers and, and scholars like, yes, this, this is the end. Um, then 2001, 9-11, the World Trade Center. 
And then the ensuing war that followed that, we thought that was the end of the world. And there's even more. 2012, the Mayan calendar, remember, that was, that was predicting the end of the world. A lot of people bought into that. Then you got 2014, ISIS and the, the spread of the caliphate. And again, uh, the, the Middle East domination of, of Islamic uh, caliphate. We're thinking that's, you know, wow, they're, surely they're going to converge and come and take out Israel. And that was a big stir, and a lot of sermons preached on that. I even preached some sermons on that. Uh, 2015, then remember the blood moon and the super moon, uh, the, the, blood, uh, the moon turning like blood, like it says in the Bible. Surely this has got to be the, the end of the world. The next super moon is in 2033, so get ready. There will be more books written. If we're still here, okay, and then you got 2017 was a big year for biblical numerology. Many scholars got together and they laid out all the numerology of the Bible and it was going to predict that in 2017 was going to be the coming of Christ, the rapture of the church. I mean, it goes on and on. People make a lot of money writing books. And let me be fair, I'm not being critical of, uh, of the research and the study and the uh, expertise, and, and there's a lot of value to all of that stuff. But where I have a problem with that is we get so dogmatic. And what happens then is when it doesn't happen, sometimes it does even more damage, and people kind of end up, well, pff, it, you know, I, I, I bought into this, and I, I, I read this, I watched this podcast, I got involved in this, and all of a sudden now we get more discouraged. Now, granted, the rapture is going to happen. This is not to say that, oh, it's all, you know, uh, not, you know, it's going to happen. There's going to be the tribulation. There's going to be uh, Armageddon. There's going to be the thousand year return uh, of Christ on, on earth, uh, this kingdom here. I mean, all of that is going to happen. None of us know when. Not, even, even the Son, Jesus said, only the Father, not, not even the Son, knows when the day or the hour comes of the Lord's return. And so we have to be careful not to be so dogmatic. And I know we need to pay attention to the times. Again, I'm not denigrating that, but I'm just saying that in the meantime, we got to keep our head. we got to keep perspective. And I think the Apostle Peter was really trying to help us. This is a great passage, by the way, a whole chapter. Uh, you can read it later today. Look what the Apostle Peter is telling the church. He's saying, most importantly, I want to remind you that in these last days, they thought it was last days, just like we believe it's last days, and it is, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming? Yeah, right. Jesus is coming when, right? What and when? Again, people still ask that today, and people scoff at it. But here, look what he says. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. When this was written and when Jesus promised his return, that was like 2,000 years ago. To us, that seems, oh, that's so far. When is it going to happen? It's so long. To God, that's only two days. <laughs> All right? It's, it's like just two days. We are, we are a blip on the radar screen uh, of the timeline of history. So we have to keep things in perspective. He goes on to say, the Lord really isn't being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. Well, it, it seems like, you know, how can a loving God, you hear this a lot, how can a loving God cast anybody to hell? Guess what? He doesn't want to. He doesn't desire to. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Not everyone will. Because, and that's the beautiful thing, he doesn't force us to repent. He gives us free will. Everybody makes a choice. Choose you this day who you will serve. But the heart of God is he wants everybody to repent. He knows everybody won't. But he goes on to say this, and so, dear friends, while you are waiting, and we are still waiting, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful. There it is, peaceful lives, not filled with worry, not filled with anxiety, not walking in confusion, lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. So it's so important for us to understand that, uh, and, and the one more verse, and remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. That's our job. That's where we're at. That's what we're to fulfill in our lifetime is, is uh, giving people opportunity to repent and to be saved. So the second perspective we need to have is don't panic. 
King James says, be not troubled. Now the third one comes, well, before we get to the third one, let me just touch on verse 12. It says sin, and actually a a more thorough translation of that word sin is iniquity. I think the King James puts iniquity. Um, it said it will be rampant and every, everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. Now, there's a difference between sin and iniquity. Iniquity is like volitional sin. It's knowing violation. You know it's wrong, but you do it anyways. That's really, that's, that's what is meant by iniquity. Sin is more an omission. You didn't really know it. You didn't know you were living the ways of the world. You weren't convicted yet, but you heard the gospel and uh, the truth. You confronted the truth of the word of God and you realized, man, I've been in sin and I need to repent. And you didn't know it. So it was the sin of omission. It was the condition you were in prior to coming to Christ. So he's saying iniquity is going to be rampant everywhere. Even among believers, their love, the, the love of believers, he's saying this to the church, the love of Christians will, will grow cold. It, it, it's going to be like a slow fade. It may not happen you know, in one moment. It's going to be that slow fade. It's going to grow cold. Just like I have this candle here. And um, you know, it's got a pool of wax that's liquid because it's close to the fire. It's close to the heat. But if I dip my little finger in here, get some wax on it, and I move it away from the fire, it waxes cold. And that's what the King James says. The love of many will wax cold. It, it becomes hardened again because I've moved away from the fire. So the, the point is here. The closer you stay to the fire, the better off you'll be. The closer you stay to the light of truth, the less you'll be in dark. When, you, when you're walking in the light as he is in the light, and you're understanding the word of God, you know, you get away from this and you're going to be in the dark. You're going, to be, you're going to be confused. And that's why it's so important to be a part of a church where you're hearing the gospel preached. It's not just being preached, but it's being taught to you so that we can stay close to the light and we can stay on fire for God. And the closer you are to the fire, guess what? Yes, you're going to get burned, but it's going to be burning those impurities and my impurities out of my life the closer you stay to the fire. I mean, you think about it. I mean, it's all around us. You can, you can see how uh, it, it's rampant. Sin is rampant. It's so easy to access uh, evil things and different things on the Internet. Uh, you can see how uh, evil is just becoming good. I mean, there's a loss of absolutes, moral absolutes. Everything's kind of gray. There's no more black and white. It's kind of in this, this squiggly room there in the middle. It's, it's kind of gray. The farther we get away from the truth, the more you know, confused we, we are. So the perspective here is is this, that, you know, not only to be ready and to be alert, but also to don't panic and worry, which leads us to the third one, and we'll find that in verse 13, where Jesus said, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The one who endures. So the second perspective is, do you have the heart to endure? Are you, are you willing to... Uh, have the discipline in your life where you're going to finish strong. You're going to stand. You're not going to quit. That's so important that we understand that this walk with Christ isn't all about enjoy and, and be happy. There's sacrifice involved. The Bible says that the athlete who endures discipline is going to win the prize. The soldier who endures discipline and follows their commander is going to win See, I know we want to be happy. We want to, you know, we're such a, a therapeutic church. Just it make me feel good. I want, to be, I want to be happy when we need to be a church that has the ability to endure and not to quit and to finish strong. There's, there's a part of sacrifice sometimes that we don't preach enough about. See, it's not just what you get from God. It's what you give up. He who gains the world but loses his soul loses everything. There's certain things we have to give up, and that requires sacrifice. There's a price to be paid to walk in supernatural power. I know we want to lay hands on people and they get well, but many of us are not willing to pay the price of sacrificial prayer. We want the candy, but we don't, we, we don't want to put in the time of prayer and fasting where, where 
that, that sanctification and that consecration before the Lord, then God's like, I can trust you with these great, incredible gifts that if, if you're not sanctified, you're, it's going to blow up in your head and you're gonna, you're gonna, your ego is going to go crazy and you're going to try to get the glory. There's something about enduring that is so important. And we're not, we don't endure just, just so that we're saved, just so we escape hell. No, we endure to enjoy some of the blessings of today. Because it's not just to enjoy future help that we get in heaven where there's no tears, no sickness. The Bible says he is a very present help in time of trouble. We can enjoy the benefits and blessings of God too, but it takes sacrifice. I love this passage. Look at Psalm 103. This is a good one to quote every morning when you get up. May I never forget. It's easy to forget, isn't it? May I never forget the good things he has done for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things and my youth is renewed like the eagles. Man, if you're wondering what, you know, I don't know what to do for devotions and my prayer life kind of ends up being the same thing and you know, it's boring, it's Pray this when you get up in the morning and when you lay your head down at night. Man, man, God, I'm looking forward to the good things you have for me today. I believe they're going to come my way. God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for healing me. You've redeemed me. You're filling me with good things. Man, that'll reinvigorate your prayer life. Just pray that every day. Man, that's awesome. See, we can enjoy some of the blessings now, but we have to endure. You know, God's not surprised that you're alive on planet Earth in this generation. He didn't want the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul alive at this time. He knew there would be a generation of people who will endure and not quit and not give up. Maybe God believes more in you than you believe in yourself. We are living in such an awesome time to be alive where we can be at our best in the, in the kingdom of God. So praise God. We have to learn to endure. The fourth one. Uh, comes here in verse 14. And it says, And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. It's going to be preached. The gospel, the good news is going to be preached. Do you know <laughs> that the gospel has never been more online and available than ever before in all of history than today. There are more people tuning in to this very message right now than are here in person. And that's happening with ministries all around the country as, as the gospel is going out. It's amazing that, that technology has given us the ability to, to, to see this fulfilled. And guess what? This is being fulfilled in our lifetime as we spread the good news. We participate in fulfilling this prophecy. Every time you're on your phone and you hit the share button, even right now, if you hit the share button to share this message, guess what? You're participating in fulfilling this promise. The gospel is going out. It's magnified when you hit the share button. Every time you give it an offering, you are participating in fulfilling the preaching of the gospel. Every time you sign up for a C team and you serve, whether it's greeting people, whether it's in the parking lot, whether it's helping out with our kids, we're not just babysitting there. We're preparing the next generation to carry the message of the gospel further than our lifetime will permit. That's what we're doing here. That's why I'm so excited about this church and, and how the Spirit of God is, is just infusing us with His power and boldness and courage to rise up in this time and to be our best and not to shrink back, not to be intimidated, but to be stronger than ever before and to spread the gospel. And it's easy to want to spread it in the world, but how about you start with your own family? As a mom and dad, as a grandparent, he listened to me and listened to me well. You can support missions. You can go on the mission trips. You can support missionaries around this world, and let's do that. We do that in a big way. But if you're not spreading the gospel in your own home, you're missing it. If you, if, make it your purpose that they will not leave my house until they know what it means to be born again. Until we talk about spiritual things more comfortably in our home. I mean, that's a great family meeting right there. Come on, family, we're going to get together. Mom just did a nice meal, but now we're going to take some time. And I want us to talk about tonight one of the most important things Jesus said. He said that if you want to get to heaven, you got to be born again. Well, what does born again mean, Mom? What does born again mean, Dad? Well, let me tell you. 
You see, we're born of water, meaning when you were in your mommy's belly, there was water in there. And when that water broke, you came out. You're born of water. There's natural birth, but then there's another birth. There's, a, there's a, another birth that all of us can have. It's called being born again, where we open up our heart and God puts his spirit inside of us. And little by little, we start as a little infant, then we're crawling, and then we're a toddler in, in, the, in, the, in the Lord, and then we're all of a sudden, we're going to grow to a mature adult. That's the goal of our home, is not for you to stay an infant or a baby. I want us all to be mature Christians in our home. Don't expect the children pastor and the youth pastor or your pastor to put all that. That's something mom and dad, don't let them leave home without it. Understanding what it means to be born again. And if you don't know yourself, I'm going to challenge you. Quit drinking milk all your life and start eating some meat. Understand what it means to be born again. It's the most important thing. And then teach it to the next generation. And, and, and we'll see that generation then take it even places we can't go around this world. So we got to spread the gospel. That's another priority that God has for us. And we have such a great opportunity. This world needs good news. This pandemic has stopped the world in its tracks. Who would have ever thought the world could be stopped on a dime like it is today? That the pandemic has done that. And there's so many people discouraged, living in fear. They need a good dose of good news. And that brings me to the last point here this morning, and that's the posture of our, the church. We find that in Luke chapter 21. Now, in Luke 21, uh, Luke is telling the same thing that Matthew, it was told of, of Jesus in Matthew 24. That's the beautiful thing about the synoptic gospels is you got four different authors with little different perspective in spite of the Holy Spirit, of course. So here Luke gives us a little different flavor as to how we're to respond, the posture of God's people in the last days. And he says this, so when all these things begin to happen, and there's a lot more that needs to happen, Stand and look up, for your salvation is near. The posture of the last day's church is to look up. It's not to look down, not to be buried in fear, not to be so negative and not to be discouraged, but to look up. But to look up for our redemption draws nigh. All those people you've been praying for and fasting, guess what? Redemption draws nigh for those, their hearts and their souls. For your marriage, redemption draws nigh. This is a new day. I'm not going to look down. I'm not going to look at the things around. I'm going to look up. That's what our world needs is a church that is looking up. That we're carrying the good news. And that we're able to help those who are struggling to understand what's been happening. I don't know what you're facing here today, but the word of the Lord to you this morning is to look up, is to look up. So can I ask you here this morning, are you alert? Are you ready? Do you know that you're saved? Are you at peace? Are you filled with anxiety? Or are you filled with worry? Are you enduring? Are you standing strong in your faith? Are you sharing the good news, not just with strangers, but with your own loved ones? And are you looking up? Are you looking up? I want us to stand here this morning. You know, even people who don't believe, the ungodly, they're going through the same stuff that we are. But see, it's up to us to look up to be encouragers. We should be acting different, talking different, living different than somebody who doesn't know yet. Amen? Whew! This is the best day to be alive, church. But are you ready? If you're not ready, I ask you to open up the door of your heart right now. And even those listening online, you can do it in your living. God, by His Holy Spirit, wants to go right into your living right now. It doesn't matter if you're not here. Get rid of the distractions right now and focus in right here with me. Jesus wants to pay you a visit right now, just like He's paying us a visit here by His Holy Spirit. But He won't force His way in. You open up the door of your heart. And he'll come in, and he'll help you to look up. He'll take the weight of sin, the guilt, the shame that you've been carrying around. He will take that away. He'll remove that so now you can look up.
And if you're here today and you're not sure if you're ready, maybe you never invited Jesus to be your Savior. Maybe you've never, you never really heard that talk about being born again. Maybe you haven't been taught that. And you'd like to be born again today. You'd like to open up your heart and let God put his spirit inside of you to begin to birth something new in your life. You can do that just by whispering a prayer right now. I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now. You don't have to say these exact words, but if you mean this prayer from your heart, God's going to put his spirit inside of you. You're going to become born again and begin to walk in a new way. Amen. Pray from your heart with me. God, I just come before you right now and I thank you, Lord, for this, this word, this, this sermon, this message. And God, I've, I've always kind of believed in you or something out there, but I never really knew that you were so interested in me that you wanted to come and live inside of me and put your spirit in me and cause me to be born again. I never really knew that until right now. And so God, I open up my heart to you. Again, I don't understand very much at all. I don't even know how to read the Bible or really even how to pray, but I open up my heart to you and I ask you to come in. Put your spirit inside of me so I can be born again. And even right now, just ask him to forgive you of your sin. In this moment right now, just ask God, I'm sorry for my sins. There's so many. I've done so many things wrong. Maybe things that aren't really bad or t- terrible because I'm a pretty good person, but I still understand that there's an obstacle and that's sin. And I want to get rid of that. And I understand that your son, Jesus Christ, you carried my sin on the cross so that I didn't have to carry it anymore. So I let go of it. I give it to you, God. I understand that's what your word teaches. And I, I receive you into my life and I'm born again. I have a new life that's beginning right now. I may be an infant. I'm going to need some help along the way. and Maybe you brought me to this church for a reason. So, Father, I thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me new life. And I'm born again. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time right now, or maybe it's been a long time, and you've prayed it again with a new intense in your heart. If you prayed that prayer, would you slip up your hand? I want to give you something. Here. Just slip it up wherever you are. You prayed that for the first time. God bless you. Others here. Come on, Dw- uh, Dwight, where are you? Let's uh, let's give, Dwight, are you somewhere? Okay, go ahead, right here. Anybody else? Just slip it up. Come on, let's welcome those that are, that are coming to the Lord today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Others here today, you've never made that commitment, but you're like, I don't care if you're a child here today. I don't care if you're a senior saint. You're coming to the Lord here this morning. Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Well, I've kept you longer than I should. So Rachel has a closing song. We'll go out with this song. But I just encourage you, when when you get back home today and you're messing around on your phone, hit share again. Share this message. Because I know you're, you're saying to yourself, man, I got some other people I wish would have heard. They need the good news today. So share it. All right, let's get that word out. But, uh, Have a powerful week. Have a great week. Amen.